Hey everyone, with the Wild Beyond the Witch Light coming out on the 21st, Josh and I wanted to go over a few different Fey races and lineages to try and help inspire your next Fey inspired character. Now we're going to go over a few different things, whether what they can do, some inspiration as to why you might want to try and play this kind of character, and we're going to go from there. So stick around, we've got a good one for you. Hey everybody, welcome back to j, j Tabletop. I'm Josh, with me as always is Jake, and today we will be continuing our series as we delve into all the little fey things out there in D&D 5e. So, Mr. Jake, what are we starting off with? What's your first option when you're thinking about a fey race? There's not many creatures out there that are more fey than a centaur. Nature's Cavalry, if you will. Not like Derek Zoolander, where you're half man, half fish, like a merman. You're like a horse man. Exactly the way that sounds, really. You've probably seen pictures of them or heard of them in the, in the past. But to me, they seem like very good warriors, right? They're very fast. They have a speed of 40 feet. And they have a charge feature that lets them get in a little extra attack when they kind of jump into the fray. The fray? No, the fray. You could do a lot of different things with these creatures, especially now that you can mix and match your ability scores to kind of go however you see fit. I think you you were talking about like a cleric or a paladin, some kind of divine. Yeah, uh, especially to too. if you're keeping with the ability score increases that they give you just right off the bat, I think it would make a great cleric. I don't know. I, I like the visual of that, of just this like horseman just riding or galloping, cantering up. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just, I think it's a, it's a cool, cool visual. I feel like I want to play one called Phil Horseman. Is that bad? What about Bojack Horseman? Uh, I see what I've you never, did there. I've never seen that, but I know that's a thing. So, you know, <laughs> somebody out there is going to be like, that's my favorite show. So Josh, why would someone want to play a centaur? At the end of the day, play this race. If you like to dance the line between nature and humanity, and really, if you just like running as fast as all hells and especially into battle. Because you want to go fast. You want to go fast. It just all goes back to Ricky Bobby. Maybe you, maybe you can <laughs> even carry your little gnome friend on your back. <laughs> there you go. So but, after centaurs, what else do we have, Josh? Yeah, uh, next one we have here is my, my, favorite, my favorite collection of fey lineages, and, and that would just be elves in general. Across the board, elves just kind of have like a bit of an inherent magic to them, as well as the fact that they're all basically immortal. I mean, not in the sense that you can't kill them, but like they're going to live to like really, really, really old. You know, they're, they're timeless. First one, definitely my favorite. I've been accused of playing this class or this race too much. And uh, to that, I say, first of all, lower your voice. And uh, that's going to be Wood Elves. I love Wood Elves. They're like the epitome of fey peoples. And no, they're not like the, the half human, half beast type thing. But when I think of a creature that just like inhabits the fey wild, and it's not necessarily anything crazy, it, it's just like essentially the humans of the fey wild, it's going to be Wood Elves. They're mm -hmm. kind of just this culture that's one with nature and the wilderness and, and all of that. And... I just think they're a lot of fun. Yeah, and mechanically speaking, they are they're a little quick too. They have a little speed boost with a speed of 35 feet. Yes, this does lean into your ranger concepts, which I think that's like a classic archetype, right? The wood elf ranger. I mean, come on, it doesn't get more classic than that. I kind of feel like that's a good way to describe it, right? They're like the humans of the Feywild. I feel like you're probably going to find a lot of wood elves typically somewhat in the vicinity of a fey crossing and i feel like yeah. that's something that would make a lot of sense if you want to have some kind of character concept that might revolve around some kind of traditional order with with the fey crossing and and something that goes along those lines i feel like a, a wood elf would be fun there but i also think it would be kind of fun to play a wood elf if you like tree houses i agree yeah yeah if you like tree houses play a wood elf for if, sure if we're going to lean into your typical archetype that you like to play might as well lean into vine and go with the high elves 
Right. So you tend to focus on warriors and particularly the, the ranger class. I love playing wizards and casters and the high elves. Uh, they vary from the wood elves a little bit because they tend to be a little more cosmopolitan, maybe a little more cultured and like refined in a way compared there. But they have just a very deep history when it comes to magic. And even, mm. you know, as a high elf, you get an extra cantrip that you can choose just for playing that sub race. Uh, if you like the idea of being like a city born magic adept, maybe you like going to the opera or you want to see the yep the Faerun Philharmonic or something, you know, then, <laughs> then you know, I don't know, probably like some sort of hipster too. So I feel like Niles and Fraser <laughs> Crane would be <laughs> high elves. <laughs> <laughs> The next option that we have for an elf subrace would be the drow. Drow are like the underdark, subterranean, often misunderstood elf variant. I think that's very fair. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because I feel like they have some in common with wood elves, but probably more so in common with high elves. I, I think there's like a... Yeah. Almost the, between uh, high elves and, and drow, there's almost like an inherent arrogance to them oh that's definitely um, fair they're also if you're playing by like typical rules they are a uh, matriarchal society and one thing just just please be aware of if you want to play a drow just like make sure that you talk to your dm about sunlight sensitivity if you don't know about it beforehand and don't have plans for it beforehand it's it's probably it might suck so just be aware of that. That's one of those things that I think in 5e, they've changed a lot of things when it comes to, uh, you know, past editions used to have like penalties for certain things. Like, you know, you maybe get a plus two to your dexterity, but a minus one or minus two to your constitution. I could mm -hmm. easily see some kind of like sunlight sensitivity change in the future. If it come to that. I, I think in the past, I've actually given a magic item that was some kind of like contact lenses or like goggles that would help. You know, yeah. maybe you could work something around that so you're not like drastically altering the lore of, you know, the people that you're with. But mm -hmm. at least your adventurer can yeah. adventure. I would probably play a drow if you like the idea of wood elves and you like the idea of high elves, but you feel like you're a little bit more edgy, you know, and you're just like a goth kid. Maybe you're a vampire kid. I don't know. Whatever. Like oh you boy. shop a lot at Hot Hot Topic, then yeah. you know Hot Topic. There it is. <laughs> if, you, if you want to shop at Hot Topic, <laughs> I guess you're playing a Drow. So after the Hot Topic shopping Drow, we come to the Eladrin, which are kind of like the weird elf cousin that they live in the Feywild, but they kind of like summer in the Material Plane. You know, like they visit. They don't live here. They're all very little moody, kind of a thing. They have this ability called Face Step, which is basically just Misty Step, but with like a little extra. Misty Step by itself is great, so a little extra is awesome too. But the Eldrin are kind of split up between the four seasons. Are you talking about like enough. the hotel, the landscaping company, or like Frankie Valley? Frankie Valley is, is exactly what I'm not talking about. So none of that stuff that Jake just said. We're talking about the actual seasons in the year. The Eldrin, they kind of split themselves up between these four seasons. And it's not really something that doesn't have to be summer for them to be a summer Eldrin. They could just kind of do that if they want to do that. And I feel like their moods kind of determine which season they're in rather than the season determining what mood they're in. So if they're feeling bold and aggressive, it might be time for a hot elf summer. You know, it might be summer season. It might be a summer Eldrin. Whereas like if you're more like autumn, it's going to be peace and goodwill. It'll be peaceful. Uh, maybe sipping on some pumpkin spiced lattes, right? PSLs. I hate them, but a lot of people love them. But if you're winter, Eldrin, if you decide to put yourself in that winter mode, it's going to be all about contemplation and dolor, which is a word that I just found out was in the English language. I always thought it was just dolor, which is Spanish for pain, which also kind of works for the winter Eldrin. And for that, it's just, it's all about like peppermint, everything, right? And just introspection. And lastly, we have spring. The spring is all about cheerfulness and celebration. These are for, for all those Eldrin out there who all want all the flowers and the jelly beans. And, and it's also for all the horny bards out there. 
Uh, why is that even a meme? It's, it's not even accurate. It's not. It's just it's just dumb. But why would you play this race, Jake? I would play this race because you get to be adaptable, right? If you want to be a summer Eldrin one day and then a winter Eldrin the next day, you know, kind of like in middle school when you were trying to figure out like where you fit in with everything, you could be an Eldrin this way. Or you could be like me and do the Eldrin variant that they have in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And that's what I use to play uh, Veil for our, our Sunday night game, Ancient Relics and Hokey Religions. But also, face tip is kind of like super cool. You can teleport as a bonus action. That's just great. It is really nice. And next, we come up to one of my all-time favorites, and that's gnomes. I think particularly forest gnomes is probably really the fey one, because like the rock gnomes and the Sverf, Sverf Neblin. I always want to say Snurf Nevlin, but that's wrong. It's Smurf Nevlin. No. Smurf Nevlin. Basically, Gargamel, Papa Smurf, Smurfette, the whole group. Yeah. Those are gnomes. No, that's not it. The Snurf Nevlin and the rock gnomes, they feel more like, more like uh, akin to dwarves, whereas the forest gnomes feel more akin to elves and more a fey in their nature, right? So they're... Uh, kind of like the gnome equivalent to wood elves. Like if you have like humans and halflings, you've got like wood elves and forest gnomes. It's kind of like a similar relationship in a way. Hmm. They're considered like woodland folk and they befriend wood elves and really any kind of like good fae that they can kind of come come up with or come around, they consider them to be their most important allies. And they also, they like to talk to animals and stuff. They're really cool, actually, and very resistant to magic. I'd say, like, play this race if you want to talk to animals, you want to befriend nature and all of nature's friends, or maybe you just want to play a little dude with the big red hat, big red pointy hat. What if you like Eskimo kissing your wife? That is also another option why you would play a gnome, but it's not a reason why you'd play a satyr. Basically, it's like a furry goat person. So it's a human with goat horns, goat hooves, and then just, like, fur all about. They kind of just want to have fun. They just love spontaneity and whimsy, and sometimes that kind of puts them at odds with the more stoic peoples, but they rarely let the moodiness of others hinder their own happiness. And one, I think that's an admirable trait in, in really anyone, but uh, it's cool to have that specifically in your, your flavor for that race. They were introduced in Theros, and it's, it's going to be in, in the Theros book, but why not apply it to other settings? Why not take more Fey when there's such a small amount of Fey out there in general? They're kind of like with their stats, they're geared towards like bards and other theater classes, as we like to call them. But Jake and I were, were talking and we think it'd make like a really cool barbarian, right? Yeah, they get resistance on all saving throws. They get like advantage on all saving throws against anything magical, spells, magical effect, whatever it is. And that tends to be like a weakness of the barbarian, right? So if you play a barbarian, you're going to be proficient in strength, con, you'll have advantage on deck saves, and then you'll have advantage on any other save that involves magic. So, yeah. Pile on all those extra hit points and then rage out. That's like a great image. They fight hard, they party hard, they just live their life according to their own conscience. And there you go. Pax Au Telemanos. Red Rising. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> I like the Goblin a lot as an option. Or Hop Goblins as well. They're not necessarily considered Fey in 5e, or really most D&D actually, but they're like tricky little guys. They, they, they originate from the same stories that brought us the Fey Wild in the first place. Yeah. Like, without Goblins are like the original Fey creatures. So why not why not allow them there and, and i think actually in the ua it seems like we're gonna have a new goblin or hobgoblin sub race for that new fey book coming out september 21st yeah so yeah there was a lot in the folk of the fey wild unearth arcana that i would expect to see some version of in the wild beyond the witch light and i could easily see doing some kind of goblin and or hobgoblin version here they do feel like more like an unseelie as opposed to like the more traditional image that comes to mind of like the forest gnome or the elf it's still a fey it's just something else even if the mechanics don't necessarily say so but who knows 
maybe they will on September 21st. While they can be seen as like bloodthirsty and these nasty, just horrible little creatures, I feel like there's also like a silly, whimsical side of them where they like to play tricks and just mess with people. And maybe that's just the way that the Amps have been portraying them for so long that it just feels that way. It's a very popular moment in, in a lot of campaigns to have your your goblin interrogation scene where they just have a silly voice and they're saying silly things. And I don't know, they, you said this before, but they're, they're kind of like corrupted gnomes, right? They're like a corrupted <laughs> gnome variant. I'd play a goblin if you're looking for just a little thing a little bit edgy, kind of like the drow, but maybe not so much. And you just want to have some fun. Another good example of that would be, say, Not the Brave and Critical Role Campaign 2. He was playing kind of like an outcast in a way, because goblins in civilized society, that's pretty rare and almost like scandalous. So that could be a fun thing to do, depending on what kind of character concept you're trying to fulfill. But speaking of the folk of the Fey Wild, the Unearthed Arcana, there was a couple other options. I think I would be shocked if they didn't show up in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Oh yeah. The first of all, being the fairy. I mean, that's like as Fey as it gets, right? Tinkerbell. They're small creatures, at least in the the Unearthed Arcana. I would personally like to see them be tiny because I think that just seems to fit a little bit better. But they don't get a penalty to their movement speed, and um, they have a flying speed. They can hover too. Like it's, it's like full flight. Dang. That's, that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. And I get it, but dang. But why else would you want to play a fairy, Josh? They're described as being like infused with magic. Honestly, that first sentence just sums all of it up. Fairies are as fey as it gets. Like if, if you are thinking about like, why should I do this? Maybe if you're like a big Peter Pan fan, and you just want to fly, you just want to be Tink, and be Tinkerbell, and just, you know, do your little thing. Play a fairy. Why not? No reason not to. So in the Unearthed Arcana, this next creature was called Rabbit Folk, but I believe it's been confirmed that they're going to be called Arangon. I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Let me know in the comment section. Just, just tell me how to say it. Spell it out. Uh, but they're basically like humanoid rabbits. And these little buggers have two rules. Live fast and live cute. Yeah, they have bonuses to uh, initiative. And it's not even just that they like have the, the fast movement, too. They have the fast reaction. I could see, you know, like it looks all cute and whatever. like Kind of like Puss in Boots, but with a, uh, <laughs> with a, a rabbit yes. or bunny instead. <laughs> like they would make it. Excellent assassin rogue, right? Picking those eyes at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you have this rabbit folk assassin. It's like, well, that's no ordinary rabbit. That's the most foul, cruel, and bad-tempered rodent you've ever set eyes on. Like, it, it's it's another thing where it kind of feels like against type, where it's this this little, like, oh, it's supposed to be nice and whatever, and like, ah, like, yeah, I love it. Just picture him, like, smoking a cigarette, like, <laughs> probably has a really deep voice, like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. There. But he knows how to flip the switch and turn on the Puss in Boots eyes when he's got to. <laughs> Incredible. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Why would you want to play like a rabbit? I think you should play a rabbit for all the reasons we just mentioned. But also, if you want to be a food source for pretty much literally any monster in the DMG. So that's going to do it for this video. We wanted to just go over a few different ways that you could use your race or lineage in order to introduce some fey themed background story, storytelling elements into the game that you're going to be playing in, especially with the Wild Beyond the Witchlight coming up, which is why we're doing this entire series. So I highly recommend that you check out that playlist, which is going to be in the doobly-doo and in the cards and probably on the end screen. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe to this video. Tell us about any kinds of fake characters that you've played in the past. We love to hear those kinds of things. Click the link tree in the description if you want to go hang out with us in our Discord and talk about these things too. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to uh, be doing some more character options that you're going to see pretty soon. So. Hopefully you'll get to see those and we'll see you next time. As they say in Happy Gilmore, we've only just begun. Man, I really want to do a Tina Fey joke for the intro. There's got to be something there like, like, hey, everybody.
we're going to be talking about fey options in D and D, like Tina Fey, and then I'll be like, mm, no, I prefer Parks and Rec. Yeah, I like uh, Thirty Rock, but Parks and Rec is more fun for me. You, yeah, you used to say "Good God, Lemon" all the time. Actually, I like them. I think they're both excellent. Yeah, it might be a straightforward intro on this one. This is a dustpan. <laughs>